I think dubstep or idiom or bass music in general is a lot more focused on rhythmic things, focused on flow, focused on how that kind of stuff feels. I mean, there's a whole culture that's just, I guess, like headbanging. That's just all entirely just rhythm. Or I guess most dub, most dubstep now is most basically entirely focused on rhythm. So finding ways to spice that up or kind of make it something you haven't heard before or like hearing, making unique rhythms, I think is um, something that people have started exploring more. And there's like a lot more things to go and mess around with there. That's kind of why I'm doing that because it's fun and sounds cool. Yeah, I feel like people are slowly um, allowing themselves to do this thing because they feel like it's slightly safer to do now or something like that versus... Mm -hmm. Back in the day, everyone was like, you can't do that. Otherwise, like, who's going to listen to your song? <laughs> and you can't make a song if no one listens to it. It's like one of those old Japanese cones. It's like if a tree falls in the forest and no one's around to hear it, does it make a sound or whatever? Mm. It's like if nobody listens to the EDM banger, did you even bang? <laughs> <laughs> Welcome to the Mr. Bill Podcast. I'm Anand Harsh, editor-in-chief of the Unst.com and Bill's manager. Surprise, Bill has been deep in the studio working on his new album, so we thought we'd give fans a bonus podcast this week. Bill's guest is Phonon, a brave young producer pushing the boundaries of bass music. He created quite a stir on Twitter a few months back with his polyrhythm tune. He's released on Odeo Records and Subtronics' Cyclops recordings, and he's got quite a bright future in the industry. Thanks to everyone who's been rating the show and reviewing it on Apple Podcasts or whatever podcatcher you use. It helps people find the show. Also, please join the Patreon to get early access to episodes, bonus content, and full video of every podcast. It helps keep the lights on. Bill just dumped a shit ton of his catalog on Audius if you want to help him become a crypto hoarder. Also in the blockchain world, he and Funny just released their first NFT based on the halftime EP artwork, which is super rad. Finally, head over to MrBillsTunes.com to sign up to become a hardcore Abletoneer. Bill has added a new micro tutorial feed and he's been dumping a ton of great content in there. Fans seem to be really loving this new HCA feed, so get on in there and give it a test drive. All right, enjoy Bill's bonus chat with Phonon. Hey, you're listening to the Mr. Bill Podcast. Hey, you're listening to the Mr. Bill Podcast. Hey, you are listening to the Mr. Bill Podcast. Hey, you're 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 listening to the Mr. Bill Podcast. Well, yeah, cool, man. Thanks for thanks for coming on. Um, it's good to chat with you. I know that you uh, had a bit of hype around you a while ago with that polyrhythm <clears throat> tune, so we should probably talk about that a bit. But then also, like, I'm just interested in, like, yeah, where you're at musically because you obviously have, like, mm -hmm. a pretty interesting uh, style, especially for the dubstep community. I feel like people in the dubstep community are like all to some degree just writing the same song over and over again. Yeah. And I feel like, uh, yeah, there's obviously some exceptions. Like y you are one of them where you're just sort of making this weird jazzy, like uh, crazy style of <laughs> dubstep. That's like not in, you know, usual time signatures and whatnot. Mm -hmm. um, <clears throat> but yeah, I'm like, what, what's your mu musical background? Um, so I don't have any like a uh, traditional, like uh, educational backgrounds. So I guess like most people in elementary school, I did like a band for a little bit. I, w I did drums, but like all I did was the snare drum and then the teacher didn't like me cause I was too energetic. So <laughs> then the teacher pissed me off. So I, I quit and then I joined choir for a little bit. I tried saxophone in elementary school too, but I never really stuck with any instrument. Uh, but I was very, uh, I think, nat naturally good at rhythm things. So I was always tapping on stuff. I got in trouble for tapping my fingers or, or pencils in class all the time. I just, I just did, I just tapped on stuff nonstop. Um, but no traditional background. But I think rhythm and that stuff was just like worked in my brain because my brain's kind of is, is kind of weird. 
because like um it likes very janky weird things because like there's always some weird stuff going on in there i'm always hearing stuff like that's basically that's basically always going on and then musically i just kind of express that i kind of just let it out <clears throat> yeah nice yeah. um yeah i see that there's like symbols in the back of your room does are you a drummer <clears throat> Uh, so I got a, I got like a drum kit when I was a lot younger, a really like small one, um, and I broke it very quickly. I hit it too hard because it was like made more for like small children, and I just beat the crap out of it. Uh, so now I just have leftover cymbals, and they're just back there, and I use them sometimes. I have a an electric electric drum kit I bought recently. Oh, nice. Over there now though, so I'm starting to learn the drums actually. But yeah, that, nice. that's very recent. Yeah, so when I was younger, my brother uh, had a drum kit because he was a drummer. So I would play that sometimes, um, although he'd always get pissed off when I would play his drums. <laughs> I feel like drummers are like weird in the sense that if you touch their drum kit, they're like, did you touch my fucking drum kit? <laughs> <laughs> um, so I didn't play them as much as I would have liked, but I, I definitely enjoyed playing them a lot. And then um, I went to, so there's this thing in Australia called TAFE which is sort of like community college, I guess, is what, what you'd call it. Mm -hmm. And after school, I went there for a little while and studied drums like as my main instrument there. So I, I also have like a fairly drummy background actually. And I feel like that helps a lot. Like I, I'm the same as you. I don't have like a, um, you know, like a crazy musical background or anything like I don't know I didn't study like jazz or I didn't study like you mm. know music theory very hard or anything but I just have like yeah a pretty rhythm oriented background also and um I feel like that helps a lot because <clears throat> when you think about music as like rhythm then it's all about just sort of like putting things on the rhythms right <laughs> and it's like you can yeah. put sort of any note on them and it somehow sounds musical and I feel like rhythmic like rhythmic things that uh sound like rhythmically coherent sound just musical to us regardless of what the notes are usually anyway because i don't know humans um especially if it's in four four right like mm -hmm. humans just are sort of locked into that that so i think we're more locked into rhythm than we are into pitch i i think i agree uh, i find that i think dubstep or idiom or bass music in general is a <laughs> lot more focused on rhythmic things focus on flow focus on how that kind of stuff feels I mean, there's a whole culture that's just, I guess, like head banging. That's just all entirely just rhythm. Or I guess most dub, most dubstep now is most basically entirely focused on rhythm. So finding ways to spice that up or kind of make it something you haven't heard before, or like hearing making unique rhythms, I think is um something that people have started exploring more. And there's like a lot more things to go and mess around with there. That's kind of why I'm doing that because it's fun and sounds cool <clears throat> yeah i feel like people are slowly um allowing themselves to do this thing because they feel like it's slightly safer to do now or something like that versus mm -hmm. back in the day everyone was like you can't do that otherwise like who's gonna listen to your song <laughs> and you can't make a song if no one listens to it it's like one of those old japanese cones it's like if a tree falls in the forest and no one's around to hear it does it make a sound or whatever mm -hmm. it's like if Nobody listens to the EDM banger. Did you even bang? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I, I think uh, that mindset is, is yeah, it's, that's stopping most people. And talking, like you mentioned earlier, the whole polyrhythm thing. That song was made purposely to entirely disregard that. Like when I made that, the, the whole idea behind <laughs> it was to not care what people were going to think of it. Because I just assumed everyone was going to hate it my mindset going into it releasing it and making it was just no one's gonna like this but i like it so i don't care i'm just gonna i'm just gonna put it out anyway and for some reason it, it likely people liked it yeah do and you remember like what a, so <clears throat> for people who are listening who don't know what it is basically polyrhythm is this like it's like all rhythm sound design like you know metallic basses and like the classic rhythm sort of drum sounds and stuff like that but it's all in like i don't know seven eight and like nine <laughs> yeah. eight and like all these weird time signatures and it's like constantly switching like tempo and shit like that and it's just like mm -hmm. a crazy um 
it's like a math metal tune meets like a rhythm tune or whatever. And it's, yeah, I don't exactly. know, like I, I can't see it like working super well in a set live or something unless it's, I mean, actually, you know what, to be honest, it could work in a set live because um, sometimes like if you play a whole set and the whole set sounds like very similar, sometimes playing something really different to break it up can be a, a good move. Mm-hmm. But um, <clears throat> yeah, and then like because you made this crazy thing, it somehow like got a lot of traction because it was like one of the only maybe different things at the time that was out. But yeah, do you remember what it was at the start that that like made it start getting like popular? Like who who was it that sort of picked it up and or who were the okay, group of I people? Can't... I can walk you through like the whole journey of, of how it kind of gained traction. But before I want to go back and touch on the set thing, I think for anyone else playing in a, playing it in a set will be like, is hard or it doesn't really work. But I found in my sets, because the whole, the whole like set is based around, it's like very different from everyone else's. It makes a lot more sense there. Cause the whole set is like kind of jazzy with dubstep and like, it's kind of a cross between the two. So the whole, th- yeah. Anyways, uh, how Polyrhythm kind of started. So, the, who kind of picked it up at first and kind of gave it some traction was Mode Step through the like Mode Step back to back Virtual Riot Disciple like live stream thing. So, right before that, Mode Step was like looking around at the underground, kind of like SoundCloud people and like messaging people. And he like he followed me and found my stuff. So, I just DM'd him one day and uh, I was like, hey, you want some unreleased stuff? And he's like, sure. So, I sent him some stuff. I didn't send him Polyrhythm, polyrhythm at first. It's like, yeah, these are sick. And I was like, at the time, I wasn't showing anyone Polyrhythm because I wanted to keep it like super secret. But I had, I was like, maybe I'll send it to him. So I asked him if he wanted to hear something really weird. So I showed him the song. He was like, this is crazy. This is mental. Because he's like a, he comes from a drummy background too. And like a jazzy background. So he, he liked it. Uh, he's like, can I play this at the set? Like tomorrow with Virtual Riot. <clears throat> so... He went there, he asked people, he showed Virtual Riot before the show and some other people, hey, I'm going to play the song, should I play it? And they all said, no, don't play it, for the love of God, please don't play that song. <laughs> and then he went and he played it anyway, and then uh, VR just made a funny reaction, and that kind of like got posted on Twitter, and people were like, what is this song? And then from there, people started talking, and then hype started building up, and then yeah. That was right before the release too. It was really good timing because the hype from the video into the release and then stuff just kept happening and happening and just kind of snowballed from there. Nice. Yeah. And then it seems like I've um the way I found out about it was I heard about it from first Subtronics on this podcast and then I heard about it from Kill the Noise also on this podcast. And I was like, <laughs> damn, if like two big dubstep guys like going out of their way to tell me about this track that they've heard <laughs> recently then i should probably check it out but yeah it's cool cool stuff um the dubstep scene is like so strange it's so like hyper particular and it's like you know track stuff you know for, like you were saying you're really particular in like <clears throat> who you show your tracks to and it's like you keep dubs and mm-hmm. something subtronics told me about was um like someone can pay like he, he'll go and pay kids or whatever to make like a VIP of a tune for him that only he can play or something. It's called like a what, I don't know what, a, a special, yeah, something mm. like that. Yeah, that- I, I think on, I I looked back on the Subtronics podcast and he I think that's when he mentioned Polyridum was like I made I asked Phonon to make me a special, but instead of paying me in money, I asked him to tweet about it because that was uh, more valuable. Oh, <laughs> uh, true. Yeah, fair enough. I mean. He's definitely got a large platform. I mean, I think the dub, dub culture, though, uh, there's, there's a whole, like, culture of people, like, just keeping dubs and people being able to buy, like, dub plates that don't get released that only they can play because they bought it. Uh, and that's, like, right now is, is very strongly tied to, like, say, side aliases. So mm-hmm. popular kind of dubs that people right now, more undergroundy ones, are making side aliases. And making like random rhythm songs that people want to buy because they're simpler and rhythm and they, they they can double and stuff. So that's kind of that's a big thing right now. And I actually, I did do this. I did make a side alias and make a couple tunes. So I'm I'm guilty of it too. But it is weird. 
True. How, how, and like how many times have you been asked to make a special or was it just that one time by September? It was, ooh, I've been asked to make a special a couple of times. The Subtronics time and then random people will DM me asking if they can make a special, if I can make a special of some song. Uh, I usually just say no. <laughs> yeah, it seems like a lot of work, right? To like basically write a fucking whole tune just for one person to be able to play in a set. Yeah, it's a lot of work. That's why I don't do it. I'm a slow worker, so that would take me a while. Yeah, but, I mean, like what the the price you would have to charge for something like that to be worth your time would have to be like thousands of dollars, right? Yeah, I mean, yeah, especially especially now. <clears throat> well, the thing is, is like um, if you make someone a special that they then just get to play in their sets, which means you don't get to... Uh, like have it on Spotify or on, you know, iTunes or whatever, collecting streaming royalties. And it's also not like bolstering up your career as another piece of art that you've made that people can enjoy and so on and so forth. <clears throat> it's like literally the value of that piece of music for your career stops at them having it. So it's like you make this piece of music that takes weeks and then they pay you what, like let's say 500 bucks. It's like that 500 bucks is all you're ever going to get from that special most likely. Mm -hmm. I mean, there's going to be <clears throat> a chance that, you know, they might show it to somebody else or like shout you out during sets and being like, hey, this is a non-released blah, blah, blah song or whatever. But for the most part, it, yeah, it seems like pretty much a, a detrimental waste of time to make them in terms of like career move stuff. But I guess if it's like fun and easy and you need to make a quick few grand or whatever to pay rent or something, then it probably makes sense. Yeah, I think uh, the people who do it, they do it for like super, super simple rhythm tunes where all they have to do is kind of like tweak a few knobs in a synth or maybe change the flow like a tiny bit somewhere and then they're happy and then people will pay for it. And then I, th I think it's a mainly just like a source of income thing because mm. the people generally doing them are mainly just like underground rhythm -y people who aren't like getting made big bookings like pre-COVID obviously. So... Like it's them selling dubs and doing specials is like how they make their money on music. So it's kind of yeah. a, a different mindset or a different way of going about money in music. Yeah. Where where are you based, by the way? I'm in Kansas and no oh, one cool. else lives here. It's just <laughs> me. Yeah. that's a, Are you in Kansas City? I'm in Manhattan, Kansas, which is like two hours from there. Okay. Yeah. I went to, I played in Kansas City once at the Uptown Theater. I've been to, so I used to travel like every weekend to Kansas City because my sibling was in like a jazz combo uh, that was in Kansas City because Kansas City has a big jazz scene. At one point also I was on a, I was really competitive in soccer. So I went to like the best team, which was in Kansas City. So I had to drive like two hours there and back for, just for practice. Yeah. Like every week? Or? Like, yeah, like every week. <laughs> Damn, I would imagine like if, if you're in like a super good soccer team, it's probably multiple times a week too, right? Yeah, I just had to pick certain ones to go to. Bro, my, my parents were, were, were legends for driving me and my sibling just back and forth and stuff. I mean, they, yeah, they're, they're, they're the best. Yeah, that's a mission. Um, yeah, the Midwest is crazy, man. It's like, <clears throat> is it super cold out there right now? I have no clue. I think it is. I just don't <laughs> go outside. Yeah, it looks like you've taped your window up there so you can't see it. <laughs> yeah. <It's> like <clears throat> is that a, just paper and tape? It's um like um poster board. I do that because I have a green screen that I pull up and if I don't block that off, it light shines through it and like makes it not uh usable. No, well, I just have so it down right now. The green screen is for um streaming, I guess. Mm. I'm starting nice. that back up soon. I got like a new, whole new setup type thing been revamping that that's why i haven't been streaming yeah nice yeah i should probably stream more i mean i've <clears throat> i've i've been streaming for a long time since like 2014 or so um <clears throat> but it's always been super intermittent like i'll just stream sort of when i feel like it which works out to be like a couple of times a month uh and during covid it's been but maybe the same like a couple of times a month but yeah i should really do it more i, I actually find it to be pretty fun <clears throat> but I always just have this like slight little apprehension in my brain that's like, no, you shouldn't stream. You should like sit here and play chain play games of chess all night and then <laughs> watch Netflix. <laughs> Very true. Um, for me, 
I'm, I'm gonna once I start back, I'll have I have like a pretty often schedule, or pretty. I do like three times a week, I think is what my schedule is. But I use those times to work on like collab things or just music because me being on stream like forces me to, to like work on the music and not get distracted. And plus like uh, having to like commentate and read chat gives me enough like stimulus to stay focused on working on the music. Yeah, so. I've, I've noticed the same thing <clears throat> with me. It's like um, when somebody's watching me and it doesn't matter if it's the stream or if it's just somebody sitting in the room watching me. I feel like I'm trying to like um, perform for someone, right? Or like mm -hmm. entertain someone. So it's like, well, I can't stop writing because then the person who's watching won't be entertained. Yeah, yeah. So I kind of like go into this mode where I'm like, all right, I'm <clears throat> I'm in entertainer bill mode. I like, <laughs> have to keep working. And it's actually good. And for a while, uh, I was literally just streaming so I could uh, get work done because I was like, I know this is a surefire way that like keeps me... Um, engaged in working on music but then I was <clears throat> I kind of worry sometimes it's like a bit of a crutch and you know maybe I shouldn't stream every single session I do and also like sometimes I can't stream the work that I'm doing because it's work for like you know film or games or mm -hmm. you know, some project that I'm not supposed to talk about or whatever but yeah no I, I feel the same way for sure but it's, it's kind of good that we have that resource now right like to I guess the internet is like a the whole thing is like a love hate relationship because in one sense it's like the whole reason why I don't have the um uh like attention span to write yeah. music like that these days is because of the internet but also because of the internet I have this streaming thing which kind of fixes that problem for me whereas like back in the day I wouldn't have been able to stream so I wouldn't have had that thing to fix the uh, not being able to write music problem for me, but I also probably would have had an attention span because the internet wouldn't have existed. <laughs> yeah. <clears throat> I think um, if I could stream everything, that would, that would like, help my production. I mean, um, what's the word? Pro, 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 productivity. Mm -hmm. But the problem is I don't like sharing almost most anything I, I'm working on that is that's like a serious, like with Polyrhythm, I kept that super duper duper secret. Same with Emmy. Emmy was even more so. I've, I'm not sure if you've heard that one, but that was like a my my like big project thingy song. It's like seven minutes. Does a bunch of weird stuff. Very jazzy. Um, but I kept. I only showed like a hand, maybe like five or less people that song before it came out. And I, I, t I intend to keep it like that when it comes to like more future solo stuff. But for some things, like. I do want to, I, I do share stuff. Like I make songs on stream called stream songs that I, I'm going to, I release. Um, so for those ones, obviously I make the whole song like on stream. So I'm obviously sharing it, but basically either I show no one or I show everyone and there's no in between. Hmm. Yeah. I'm kind of more on the show everyone spectrum. Like I definitely um, will just, uh yeah show whatever like I, I sometimes on stream i'll just get bored of working on music and just go through my whips folder and just play the whole whips <laughs> folder and like, i just don't give a shit <clears throat> um I, I actually think it just helps right like i've shown this one song uh on at the end of every podcast uh and just constantly on streams and like played it in sets a ton of times it's called um pleasure seeker it's like this weird sort of dubstep tune um, and I've shown it just tons of times and still people ask me constantly or like when it's being released and I'm like, dude, it's like literally released. Like it gets, just go fucking rip it at the end of every podcast. <laughs> and like, um, but I mean, for some reason, like people still have this idea that like when it gets officially released, it's like a different thing or something. Yeah. And it, it's I guess it is because it's like once it gets officially released, you can buy it and you can have it on like your iPod and shit pretty easily or your iPod, who the fuck uses an iPod? You can have it on <laughs> your phone and like, um, and you know, then it also like has the artist's final stamp of approval attached to it, I suppose as well. Yeah. I think uh, for me, I'm finally showing stuff that is like, basically the reason I, I don't, like showing stuff or the reason I've ch I chose to not show stuff is a lot of the time it's basically just so to like just to protect my ideas kind of so like I don't because all the time I'm, I'm doing weird stuff or like doing new things or trying to do new things and I don't want 
it's like show it early before it comes out or before like it's, it's public or whatever. So I don't want people to like hear that and then go and take my idea and do it before, and do it before me. And then they get the credit, you know, it, I just want to, I want to protect my ideas, but if, but if the music doesn't have any like new ideas or like new crazy stuff, then I don't care. Mm. Yeah. Interesting. Yeah. Here I was talking to hero boss the other day and <clears throat> he said he um, doesn't like to show stuff because you only sort of get one chance to make an impression on, on someone with a song. Um, and if you show them like a whip, then they already have, you know, some idea of how the song should finish and they already have some idea of how the song was, which means if you change it in a bunch of different ways, they might be like, oh, no, I liked it better before and mm-hmm. like all that kind of stuff. Um, so what, what do you do like outside of music production? Um, so right now, basically not much. I sit here and I try to produce music and most of the time I fail. Not in terms of not having ideas, but just being distracted by the internet and my friends and also video games. But before music, I did karate. Oh, cool. And I, I did like s- competitive performance karate, basically. I did the bow staff. It's a big stick and you spin it around and you do cool stuff with the, the big stick and it's cool. Um, and the weird thing is because that's like a, a, a much more niche thing, smaller community... And I was like really good at it. I'm technically better at spinning the bow staff around than I, than I am at music. Like I have, I have world championships in spinning a stick around for some reason. Nice. That sounds pretty. So are you like a black belt in, or whatever? Are they what's the yeah, measurement yeah. for? I'm like a, a second degree black belt and just in, in taekwondo. Right. In well, taekwondo I, 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 learned, I learned like I learned um, I did like the same thing kind of. I, did, I, I went to a Taekwondo school, but karate is kind of like a more broader term, I guess. Uh, I'm not sure. entirely sure, but I went to like a local school. I got like my second degree black belt. Uh, it, took, it took a while. And then early on there, they like introduced me to the bow staff. And then I like took it and I just went online and searched people up doing it. And then taught myself through watching people like, do stuff. And I got like better than the, the, than the instructors. And then I went to tournaments, uh, and then I won all the won all those tournaments, and then I basically just kept like, getting better. And then I went and found like the most competitive circuit that there was for it, and then I went on there and tried to get on like a really competitive, prestigious, cloudy team with like a so I, so I was like fancy or something. And then I did that, and then the people on the team were mean to me. I was like, I don't like this anymore, and then I stopped. <laughs> You're like, fuck this skill that I work so hard for. This guy called me a noob. Exactly. <laughs> I'm, 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 a, I'm out. <laughs> also, it was just super expensive because all the tournaments were just all like all around North America mm. and they didn't pay for anything. So I just had to, we had to like pay for the flights and the hotels and just like travel everywhere. And it was so much money. And the reward was like, like if I kept going, it was like, do I keep, do, we, do I keep spending this much money to spin a stick around in hopes of maybe getting some one or more, like one more random title thing that doesn't matter. Like the, the value just like got less and less over time. Yeah, and that then, makes sense. Yeah, it was, it was weird. It was fun though. What was yeah. like the main value you think you got out of learning karate to that level? I, ooh, besides just having a really like a cool looking random skill um it's made me a lot more confident in terms of like maybe being half being having to defend myself or something because i do know i do know like traditional practical karate as well um but i think it was just a good exercise of like creativeness because my specialty in there guys kind of the same with music was like being really creative and inventing new tricks or like making new things that people hadn't done before. Like making really weird releases or really weird tricks that were just stupidly technically difficult, but were I were cool. Like no one else could do the stuff I was doing. But because of that, when I went and competed and like I did my form and stuff, I was just doing the most the craziest crap and I just dropped my weapon sometimes. Most of the time. And when you drop your weapon, like when you're competing you get disqualified immediately 
So basically, everyone's like, this dude's crazy, but he never like hits his form. So he's always disqualified. So <clears throat> is there any videos of you online doing this? Yes. There Wait, are, what, but I'm not... what should I search for? I mean, I had an old, I had an old Instagram. I'm not sure if I want to, if I want to say it. Okay. I'll, I'll, I'll send no you worries. some videos later because I have right. some. <laughs> but I'll, I'll leave other people to find. It. Yeah, fair enough. And now you're doing a dubstep, which is the same thing. You have to travel pretty far mm -hmm. to like play it to people, and every now and then there's a flight attendant who's an asshole or something. Yeah, but that flight attendant, I don't have to like, like be with them all the time. But I don't have to compete with them, so I can just be like, ha. Huh. Mm, true. Speaking of flights, um, that just reminded me of COVID. How's COVID doing in Kansas? Like, what's the situation um, like there? I think we're doing not that good. I think. I think mm -hmm. we like aren't like the just, worst. We're probably you just like don't go outside or anything. But like, um, no. For the times that like, do your your family like some of your family members probably go outside, right? Yeah. So my mom teaches at like a middle school. Oh wow! So schools are open. Yeah. Oh, Wait. Shit. Yeah. Schools are yeah. open. It's not good. Um, okay. but luckily. We're all like we're all very safe, and my mom's been like working at the school for a while, like since whenever school started. Wait, and so schools did they ever shut down there? Yeah, they were online for a bit, and then they are no longer online for some reason. I don't know. It's really weird and dumb, and everything sucks. And like the or like the district and whoever the people who run the stuff suck, but that's like the case for everywhere. So. But yeah, um, I don't leave here. Even before COVID, I did not leave my room because I sacrificed like a... Wait, you mind if I talk about school stuff or like go on a random story? <laughs> yeah, go for it. <laughs> okay. So, I, so like when I was a, I think a junior or I was about to be a junior in like high school, uh, I basically stopped going to the regular high school. I went to K-State. I started taking all my classes at the Kansas State University. Uh, so, so as a high school student, but like just taking all my classes there because the high school wasn't working because it was just a bunch of busy work and I couldn't get it done because <coughs> ADHD and it wasn't working. So I just went and took harder stuff, but less of it, basically. So then I just didn't talk to anyone there because I was young. And also like a late bloomer, so I was very small and looked like a little baby child. So I just didn't talk to anyone because I didn't think anyone, anyone wanted to talk to me. So like the last few years of my high school, I just had just like no like no in, in real life friends. But I got really good at music, and that's still how it is right now. I don't I don't have like I don't have any like friends like from here. So I just sit in this room and I talk to people on Discord and I make music. <clears throat> so when COVID happened, it basically was. The world around me is burning, but I'm doing I'm so I'm doing the exact same thing, like before COVID and 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 now. Yeah, I feel like that has been true for a lot of people. Um, it was pretty true for me because I mean, like the nature of writing music or whatever is like pretty solitary, anyway. Um, <clears throat> but there's definitely like it made me realize how much I miss the. Um, the little sort of bits in between writing music where I actually, you know, see people. You know, mm -hmm. Like, for instance, I'll you know, sit here writing music all day and then, like, go out and meet someone for lunch or dinner or something and, and then come back and, like, write more music. And um, Or, you know, it's, like, not uncommon to... Yeah, I was actually mostly just going out for meals, <laughs> to be honest. <laughs> and then um, also, I guess, like, flying and you know, all that kind of stuff. Like on the weekends, having to go out for shows, like having my weeks sort of punctuated with like a show at the end of every mm -hmm. week was like kind of helpful, stuff like that. <clears throat> so look, my life feels like it's changed a lot, but re realistically it, it hasn't that much. Um, so how was going from like shows to, to no shows? Um, Is it like better or worse? Um, luckily for me, I'm like in a financial position where it's, 
not affected me too much financially at least because I like ha have set up my career in such a way <clears throat> where I have a lot of things that like I get my income from that aren't shows mm -hmm. uh, <clears throat> so that was kind of good and then um the other differences other than financial <clears throat> so the like experiential differences have mostly just been uh like I was saying that that sort of punctuation of life uh of having these like shows at the end of every week uh, it's been kind of weird to not have those deadlines. Um, and I've talked about this on the podcast a few times. Like I, I, I work really well to a deadline. Uh, and to have a show at the end of every week, it's like having a deadline at the end of every week, right? Where you're like, oh, uh, you know, yeah. for instance, like we were working on uh, our collab and you were like, oh, I can't work on it because I have to like finish a bunch of shit for this like show thing, like this online show or whatever. Or um, <clears throat> yeah, so I would kind of have that experience, but every week. Where I'd be like, all right, That's I have helpful. to like, yeah, finish a new thing every week, and and it would keep me really productive. And then also like flying and like being able to play it to people every week. It was like, not only did I get to, um, you know, have this deadline for writing, but then I would also get to play it and see people's reaction, and then come home and tweak it, and like just do that week in and week out until I like, you know, got things really dialed. So it was pretty cool like in that way so I, I would say in, in like a lot of ways I've actually been less productive by not having shows but uh <clears throat> at the same time I've been writing a lot more music that um that I actually want to write which is like you know more IDM-y glitchy down tempo-y stuff and then I've been like writing you know the odd banger as well here and there but I feel like um like bangers have lost a little bit of their application right now because shows don't exist or at least they don't in a lot of places like here they def definitely do not um <clears throat> so yeah it's uh yeah that's that's kind of how it's been i guess like not doing shows but i am uh honestly not in like any huge rush to go back to touring how i was because i was doing like you know 50 to 100 shows a year it's a lot on your body I don't think you should be like flying that often and stuff. It's, it doesn't feel like it's that good for you. So I feel like this built-in break honestly has been like, it's been like pretty positive for me. And I think it's been positive for a lot of artists because I think there was a lot of artists who just would never have taken a year off touring if if like, if they weren't forced to, you know. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> and I think it's given us all a lot of time uh, to sort of like, sit back and, and be like, fuck, like, what was I even doing? I was sort of just like manufacturing bangers to play at shows every weekend um, <clears throat> without much like thought for making interesting music or anything like that. Um, and this is also a thing I was talking talking about the other day on this podcast with Hero Bust is um, it's like a, I hope that when when all artists go back to shows that we don't just like revert straight back to to where we were at with music you know like i hope it doesn't <clears throat> just go straight back to the you know who can make the most testosterone filled <laughs> rhythm you know mm. and it's because i feel like we're seeing a lot of pretty interesting vibey music come out right now because people know that it's like they don't have to play it at a show so they don't have to like make the dance floor work right now um which takes out this huge sort of requirement out of the writing process and allows people i think to do a little bit more of what they what they actually just want to do yeah, I think um, I I hope the same thing, cause I also hope when shows come back, that the lineups on things or like the artists being booked for the for the shows are gonna be the ones who kind of made that interesting music or like made and did like the different things like the the people. Well, that'll never be the case, and the reason why is because shows are always gonna just be an economy, right? So it's like. Um, <clears throat> the people who get booked on the shows are always just going to be the people who sell the tickets. Uh, mm -hmm. And you, you can make the coolest music ever. And if you don't sell tickets, then... It doesn't matter. It doesn't matter, shows. yeah. Like you, I mean, you might get booked, but like you'd be like an opening act and you'd only get paid like, you know, 100 bucks or something like that. Yeah. And the reason, you know, and then on, on the opposite end of the spectrum, it's like <clears throat> you have these people who can sell out stadiums, but you know, I don't necessarily think that they're making extremely interesting music or anything like that. And they're getting booked for the biggest shit ever, right? Like mm -hmm. headlining Coachella and playing, you know, Madison Square Garden, all that kind of stuff, just because, you know, a lot of people will pay for it. So like this, you know, because they have this economy thing going for them, they make enough sales to, to do the thing. And yeah, 
So I think in that sense, um, like making interesting music is unfortunately never enough to fix the show industry. Uh, it also has to come with this like ticket sale thing, which is sort of annoying, but yeah, it yeah, exists. I, I wonder if you could translate the, 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 the more interesting music to like a, a large audience. They got like a really big, like comparable to the super like uh, mainstream ones that are like currently selling, selling the tickets and stuff. I think that it could be, it, it might be feasible if like those people built up a large enough audience to like sell enough tickets. Cause if you, if you, if you build up like the same like size audience and like the people want to go and see you live, then you can sell the tickets and then you can do this stuff. I think unless mm -hmm. I'm, <clears throat> I, I yeah. hope. Yeah. Yeah. And that sometimes happens, you know, like, um, every now and then there'll be someone who's doing something sort of weird and interesting and they'll get pretty big. Like, I don't know. I think like Kendrick Lamar's stuff is sort of like a little esoteric and strange and like Kanye yeah. is like a little esoteric and strange. And, um, <clears throat> you know, to some degree, like Anderson Pack is writing some pretty interesting stuff. And like these guys are obviously uh, selling out massive, massive stadiums worth of tickets and therefore you get those kind of shows. But yeah, <clears throat> I, I don't know if there's any way to solve that economic problem in music without like some kind of, I don't know, socialist universal <laughs> income type situation, which, you know, could be cool. Just give everybody tons of money and put on whatever shows you want. People go to whatever <laughs> they want. And everyone gets paid the exact same. <laughs> I don't think that'll ever work though. We're too we're too deep into this capitalist shit. Yeah, I think like ev everyone's like uh, obviously we all want at least the people who have not nuts for brains want like reform and like a better. A better system because obviously capitalism is dog water and not pog champ uh, and this is is just causes a lot of harm but to like get out of that the amount of work or like the amount of like it, it seems very very hard to even just make small changes to like what's currently what the what the status quo is which is which is sad because for some reason there's a a large part of like our the especially like America's population that hears like they they they're just they're they're like fed just um like just constant kind of like propaganda type things so when they hear people people can just like say oh that policy is like is just, just communism or some or something and then people will be like oh that's bad but in reality it's literally the people are just like proposing universal health care or something or like something that it, that shouldn't be like controversial, but yet people have been conditioned or like been told that it's some awful thing or that like, I, I don't get it. I personally cannot comprehend it, but like it's, I don't know how we're going to get out of that hole, but I hope we can. I don't know. Shouldn't, we should be talking about music and not politics, but <laughs> Yeah, or we can. Um, do you do you fuck around with crypto? Oh, I don't. I don't like have any money in it, but I think it's. I think it's pretty swag. It's in interesting. Why? Why? Why do you think it's swag? I think. Uh, I don't know. Just seeing seeing all the stuff happening right now with like crypto, especially with. Uh, it's like the the recent like uh, GameStop situation and like Dogecoin, um, where. People are punishing like the big banks for trying to like ab abusing their power, and people and people calling them out. And the well, people GameStop is different to Dogecoin. GameStop yeah. is uh, stocks in an actual company. Dogecoin is a meme of a fucking coin. Yeah, yeah. But like for, for like the, the GameStop stuff, um, I, I thought was 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 pretty cool because it was people like going against Wall Street trying to short them and just. Because they just thought the GameStop was going to go down and then the people were like, F you, we're going to invest in it and then ruin ruin you and put you billions of dollars like in the hole. Which was, it was kind of, it was kind of crazy, crazy to see that the people had that power to just screw over like the, the like the hedge funds. It was, yeah, I'm not well versed in the economics, but.
Man, I should sell my Dogecoin. <clears throat> so I bought Dogecoin in like 2018 or something like that. <laughs> I bought 25,000 Dogecoin and I still have them. Um, so I wonder what they're worth now. Looks like they're worth about half a cent each right now or something like that. I think I bought them when they were worth like a tenth of a cent each or even less. Um, but yeah, I mean, I, I don't know. I... I I'm not that invested in crypto. I bought a bunch of weird shit back in the day. For instance, like the Dogecoin, I just spent like 50 bucks on a bunch of different random like cheap ass coins because I was like, even if these go up a little bit, like they're going to be worth a bunch, right? And mm -hmm. that's exactly what's happened with Dogecoin. I think like I spent 50 bucks on it and now it's like probably what I'm holding is worth like I don't know, a couple of thousand dollars. Nice. I don't know much about it. So I think the technology is cool. I think the idea, like the underlying idea is cool, which is um, <clears throat> you should uh, take away like the middleman and take away the power from the banks and, you know, <clears throat> not have these intermediaries between your transactions between each other. Everything should be like this sort of peer-to-peer -peer thing with a blockchain in there. So yeah, everything is, uh, you know, on everything is logged in a file somewhere and, and everyone can publicly like see said file. So it's just like a safer way of trading currency and all this kind of stuff. And it's like decentralized and blah, blah, blah. Um, that's all cool. <clears throat> and it's a good idea and whatnot. But the problem is like, that's not why people are buying it. People are buying it so they can sell it to somebody who's dumber than they are for hi a higher price and make money off it. Right? Like people are mm -hmm. trading it like it's stock. That's and, uh, -huh. You know, people aren't people aren't buying it for this decentralized reason. People aren't like because if that was the case, <clears throat> the price of Bitcoin would be stable. Everyone would just buy it and hold it because they'd be like, "Well, we need to just like hold it, right? Like it's mm -hmm. we're keeping it as currency for when society collapses." But that's not what people do. They buy tiny amounts of it, wait for it to go up in price a tiny bit, sell it, wait for it to go down in price a tiny bit, buy it again wait for it to go up, sell it again, et cetera, et cetera. <laughs> that's what you call a day trader. And that's like pretty much I think what makes up 90% of the Bitcoin market is just people who are trading it like it's stock. Yeah. Which is just human greed, really. I mean, it's exactly the thing that everyone is laughing about with the <clears throat> with the Wall Street bets thing and GameStop stock. And um, yeah, I mean, I, I think it's funny that that these people who are clearly using Bitcoin for this reason to just try and like cash out on greater fools than them uh, and then try and like uh, code it in this uh, fantasy that they're doing it for decentralization is just fucking stupid. Yeah, it's it's like a it's a it's a clash of ideals. But like uh, Bitcoin, I think B Bitcoin is is, is um like in, in terms of like its price, like Do Dogecoin right now is is a big thing, but its price is like a fraction of a cent. Mm -hmm. But like Bitcoin, at one point, one Bitcoin was like 40 grand or something or something like 30 grand or something stupid. Yeah. What is it now? Bitcoin price. It is $37,000. Holy. That's insane. I think I have like a tiny bit. I should sell it. That's so... Oh. I, th I think it's uh, like Bitcoin compared to everything else. It's like such a large and stark contrast in like pricing or like how... I'm not sure how it got there, but it's very wild. Oh yeah, I have point uh, point three six Bitcoin. Let's go. That's yeah, a I lot. Should, yeah, it's almost like ten grand in Bitcoin. I should sell that shit. You should sell that <laughs> point. Wait, actually, um, I think if Bitcoin sold thirty seven grand. I heard from someone that is is like going down right now, but it's like estimated. To like go up to fifty grand, fifty grand later this year. I have no clue if that's accurate. I just heard it from someone random, so it's probably not true. Yeah. So I don't. I'm sort of on the fence on like because I do. I have like a just a bunch of different coins. Like my coin portfolio when I bought it all was like I don't know. I think I invested like two or three thousand dollars into it, and I think now it's all worth like I don't know something in the realm of like fifteen or twenty thousand or something like that. That's but um. <clears throat> Yeah, my my whole like sort of point of uh, of buying it all was just to hold it for this like 
de- this society collapsing reason, you know, like if society ever does collapse and we do revert to all of these coins and, and want to, um, you know, switch over to using crypto full time to operate society, then yeah, it is good to be on like the front end of that. But I'm not going to be one of these people, I think, who like invests their entire life savings into fucking ha- owning one Bitcoin or something like that. <laughs> a singular Bitcoin. And then like a year later, it's worth a cent-, a cent again and then you have no money. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Yeah, it's so volatile. I don't understand like why it goes up and down in price so much. It's like nothing else in this world goes up and down in price like that. It's a... Uh... I think money in general is, is a very weird is, is is weird, but also it just it, it's something that just occurs in like naturally within just like uh like societies like because people like trade stuff or like exchange things and eventually be like people people want stuff like in return for what they give out so then currency just naturally evolves but like. Wait, so you think we shouldn't have a system to trade with for goods and services? No, I'm just saying that it's a it's like naturally entwined in society, but also it's a very it's very weird. Like money at this point seems like not a real thing with everything that's happening, but also it, it is and also Why? it has to exist kind of. Why does it not seem like a real thing? Because everything that it, it a lot of the stuff, like so just stuff going up and down all, all the time, like cryptocurrencies, like where where does crypto's currency value come from? Why does this piece of paper have value? <clears throat> yeah, well, that's the thing with crypto is like its value just comes from what everybody agrees that it's worth who's trading it, right? Yeah, because so so like the, the the money comes from just like the the general consensus of hey, this thing is now worth this much that we just kind of made up so that we can trade things. So like that is like just made up by people but also it, because we all agreed to it and like agree that it has value it has value but also we just kind of made it up but it has value it's it's it's, it's weird what is weird yeah i mean i suppose fiat in that sense is is similar um but it's just way more stable it seems like and the reason why it's stable is because of inflation i guess like we're able to just keep printing more money so the pro- the thing with Bitcoin and the reason I think why it increases in value so much is because there's a finite amount of it. There's like 21 million Bitcoin in circulation, or there, there will be only ever 21 million Bitcoin in circulation. Uh, whereas, um, you know, something like Fiat, it's like there's an infinite amount in circulation really because we just keep printing more. So that's why it always stays down at the value it's at. Whereas like if you imagine uh, with Fiat, uh, like the US dollar, if we just never printed any more US dollars from like, I don't know, 1950 onwards, like imagine how much a US dollar would be worth yeah, to somebody right now. To be. That would be crazy. So I think in that sense, like that's probably why Bitcoin has gone up in so much. So much. But I also think that it's like, I don't know, pretty damn <laughs> overpriced. But I mean, like you said, <laughs> if everybody agrees that it's worth X, then it's worth X. Yeah. Have you... um? You've surely seen like the the Bill Words history of the entire like universe, right? I rewatched that again yesterday and was like watching I don't know, I, I went into a Bill Words binge because I just like Bill Words a lot. And uh and watching like the him describe the societies like evolving with like um like going straight from like kind of cavemen, people like farming, and then farming straight into like uh, having currencies and, and, and stuff. It was like a... This conversation just made me think of that. Because like it started out with just people making food. And then once someone started like making more food than other people, people wanted like that person's food. And like that person kind of became the important person. So people just kind of lived near them and that they just traded to get stuff. And then like j- just from someone like farming, out of that like spewed like societal hierarchy... And it's, it's, so that that it just that that part of the video just made me think of like how like hierarchy and like currency kind of just it, like it naturally just comes out of people existing and interacting. But yeah, like do, you, that, do yeah. you think that we could have evolved any other way to like deal with any other sort of system? 
that that's the problem. I I can't I can't think of anything like that gets rid of like currency or like hierarchy unless you the only way is if somehow someone back then like like obviously forever ago knew that that would happen and then from like the very start they're like okay we're gonna do this very we're gonna use this different system that kind of gets rid of or avoids the problems that are, are going to occur but like the people didn't know that because society, but how could they like, do that because like think about the guy who has the bigger house who grows all the food Imagine if everybody was like, no, 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 we're not going to like go by your system. We're going to like do our own system or whatever. And he was like, all right, well, fuck you. You don't get my food. And then they just all die. Yeah. <laughs> They're like, all right, man, we'll uh, we'll go whatever system you want. <laughs> like you like, got all the food. So. There need to be like a time traveler to, co- to, to go back and be like, do this. And like, like, don't do it. It's going to turn do- into capitalism. <laughs> it's not good. <laughs> no. This is a, this conversation derailed. <laughs> oh, that's how all the conversations go on this podcast. It's okay. sure it it always gets down into some bullshit. I like speaking bullshit. of which, though, um, I should probably bail actually because I got to prepare for this doctor's appointment. Um, yeah, the other day on the Richard Divine podcast, I passed out and cracked my head open. Now yeah, I, I, I saw that. Room. Actually, yeah. um, a friend of mine showed me the video. Yeah, I was like pretty damn. hectic. So um, yeah, now I need to talk about my head with a doctor <laughs> <laughs> let's go yeah hope that goes yeah, man, well. I, I appreciate you coming on and chatting with me for an hour uh and yeah we should work on our tune some more yeah i'm gonna I have a few questions about it i just need to get all the plugins to work because i have to like install a bunch of plugins i've been putting it off but yeah thanks, thanks for having me i had fun talking yeah, using no my reason. mouth and stuff fuck yeah all right peace See ya. Cheese. Hey, thanks for listening to the Mr. Bill podcast. These episodes are edited and uploaded by Robert Fumo. You can also support the show, get early access to episodes, and hear bonus content by going to patreon.com forward slash Mr. Bill's tunes and becoming a patron. Uh, please rate and review on iTunes unless you're going to be a little shit about it. And all the links to my various platforms are at Mr. Bill's tunes.com. Thank you. I know what I'm